And we're live and recording. Uh, welcome to another uh, Midday Musings. I put it on LinkedIn before. I can't believe it. But I think in terms of registrations, watches, listens on the podcast, um, we tipped over uh, 500, which is amazing for something that was just um, done on a whim, uh, really, uh, of feedback from the WhatsApp group and things. So thank you, everyone. Um, everyone who's live, and I can see see. see still see people uh, filtering in thank you um and if you're watching on a replay thank you as well and if you're listening on a podcast thank you uh today is all about employer branding um you know this person next to me whether she's that side or that side it depends um it's amelia sordell um introduce yourself amelia please Hello, I am Amelia Sonnell. I am, uh, I guess, a marketer by trade. I work with recruitment agencies on their employer branding and their recruitment marketing. Mm -hmm. so, and so. and we're going. And do you know, this is a the reason I was speaking about employer branding. It, it's been, you know, it's been spoken about and it's taken on a high high level of importance. Probably, you know, over the past twelve to eighteen months, really, I've seen lots and lots. You know more discussions about it um but <laughs> probably even more so over the past two or three months it's gone up another another notch with um with various things that we'll be speaking about um including uh covid19 but also including uh the recent uh, black lives matter movement um employer branding is playing a very important role but what i always feel with employer branding and you, it's why we always see the question is where does it sit Whose responsibility is it? Is it um, is it us as as marketers? Is it um, an IR function? Is it uh, an HR function? Is it a bit of both? Should it now be and it does exist in some companies a stand a standalone function that builds in everyone? What do you think? Yeah, so I, I think like if anyone's heard the podcast that we did, God, it feels like it was years ago. But I think it was it probably was year. about a year ago. Yeah, yeah, I think it was actually. I think it was June last year. Um, God, so much has changed. I, it, like going back to my points there, my my belief on this whole kind of whose job is it hasn't really changed. Um, I believe there needs to be a, a, someone who is driving that initiative, and ultimately for me, that starts with marketing. It has to like if you're if you are someone that views marketing as the life and the kind of lungs of your business, which you should, because your marketing should be dictating your sales strategy and all the rest of it. Um, you only have to look at the SaaS ecosystem to see how powerful marketing can be in generating generating business and, and overall brand um, company performance. But whoever it is that is creating it doesn't necessarily need to be the champion of it. So for me, it is, okay, marketing's role in this is very important in creating that roadmap, creating that strategy. And part of that will have to come from an IR function, IR function, you know, leaders within the business. Where does that that employer brand um, lie within the sort of business goals? Like, how, how does that match up? Like, what headcount do we need? Okay, what, what does that look like in terms of a branding um, piece? But also the employees need a stake in this. Like, inherently in in is an employer branding kind of exercise people go right what kind of business do we want to look like we are and <laughs> how can we make it look like it's a really cool place to work and let's stock up the fridge with free soda and do all these amazing things but a lot of businesses forget that the whole reason that you're creating this brand is because you want to generate a talent pool of people that want to work for you mm -hmm. and who and better? all the advocates for you, regardless Absolutely. of working for you. Yeah. Correct. And what what better way to link that up in asking your existing employees to have a stake in that? Because not only does that engage them and create kind of advocacy with them, because they're like, how nice is it to be asked as an employee to come and have a come and come and put your vote in, come and have your say on what the outward branding of the business is going to be like, that's a big responsibility. Mm. So it gives you a stake in the pie um, of that employer brand and that branding piece as a whole. So it's an engagement piece. It means that you're automatically ta tapping into your target audience. I hope, because if you're not tapping into your target audience, we're speaking to your employees got bigger problems than your employer brand. Um, and it means that you can kind of create a, 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 an EVP and a, an employer overall employer brand that, aligns with the business you are currently but also the one that you aspire to be and i think that's a really important thing um yeah. to have lined up yeah and, and you know all those unnecessary values and words on the wall are completely yeah. ridiculous <laughs> as well aren't they and the majority of businesses especially recruitment businesses um god knows how many recruitment businesses have the uh words like integrity 
professionalism you know things like that are a given well they, they certainly should be if they're not if they're not a given uh, they should be but um your your promotion of this event yesterday was uh, was talking about um catfishing um which i i think you know it, it's so so true um i i had a post yesterday uh, or two days ago and it was talking about um my son who just had his uh mmr vaccinations and beforehand i told him well if you if you have this vaccination arthur it's going to give you superpowers like a superhero he went and had the vaccination it didn't it, it hurt him and he just screamed in my face non-stop and told me i was a liar <laughs> and, and and automatically and i didn't even think about it it's like that's that's happens now that happens in terms of what companies recruitment companies or, or any other companies when it comes to their employer branding, they say what it is or what yeah. they think it is when it actually isn't, isn't it? So do you want to expand on that bit? Because I know you spoke passionately about it yesterday as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it is catfishing, isn't it? Like we <laughs> see this a lot. We see, you know, brands talking about how they encourage this and they encourage that. And, and when you're working with their sort of family, a lot of these businesses say that it's a family. Mm. Um, you, you get all these things and, you know, we'll, we'll develop you, we'll train you, we'll do all this stuff and how amazing our culture is and look at our bean bags and all the rest of it. And actually inwardly, they are the total opposite. And I know because I've worked for these companies before. We all have. Not now. <laughs> Sorry, Lemon Westerns, but we've all worked for these companies before, um, you know, that rope you in with all these promises and all these things. And then once they've got you in the door, it's a completely different story. Mm -hmm. And I think with those businesses where they've, to go back to what I was saying earlier, where they've missed the trick there is they've done all the easy stuff. They've done all the stuff that like looks good and sounds good and, you know, it's going to make people think, yeah, this looks like a nice business, but they've not done the hard therapy to get there. It's it, like going deep into your current employees kind of psyches and figuring out their drivers and their motivators and what's pissing them off and what they like and, you know, how you can improve and be self as, you know, self-aware as you possibly can as a leader of the mm. business to ask those questions. Um, that's really difficult to have to face that. You know, everyone says they have an open door policy. They don't really. How many people would go to their boss and go, you effed up here. How can we change it? There's not really many businesses that have that kind of policy. And oh, if, they, if, if they did, that person, if they did have that, they'll probably be out the door quite soon. Correct, because <laughs> everyone's got an ego, right? But we have to mm. put our ego aside and say, OK, what? Well, let's do the groundwork here. Let's do that, that real kind of therapy of working out the kinks of our business, because ultimately you'll be better for it, because not only will it help your employer brand, but it will help your business function. Like mm. all these things are intertwined. It's not just about, I think when people think of brand, they think of like the aesthetics and like the nice, pretty shiny packaging on the outside of a business, but your brand has to permeate every single part of your business. You have to live, breathe, die by it. Yeah. Um, like, like, and, like Fiona says there in the comments, you know, an employer brand that's not reflected in the employee experience, employee experience yeah, yeah complete, uh, waste, complete waste of time it, and it wastes we, everyone time everyone's yeah. time we get caught up i think in employer brands being just an attraction tool um yeah. you know a, a nice shiny shiny career site we, it, it's important it's important but it needs to make up the whole kind of ecosystem of of everything and you know employer brand is an attraction tool it is a retention tool but it's also an advocacy tool because you know if you can build up a you know an army of alumni who have worked mm. with you and they've left for various reasons and people leave businesses for you know a myriad of reasons it's not always just salary or the bad boss or something you know personal circumstances can change and things you know if you've got that employer brand now down alongside the employee experience is you know a good a good lever and an advocate lever is is probably a hell of a lot more powerful than any yeah. money you're spending on the attraction side of the piece of people who don't know you yeah absolutely and i think a good example of that and probably a relevant example of that is airbnb's offboarding like their mm. offboarding through this redundancy process has been absolutely phenomenal and that's not just outwardly like i i know i know someone who knows someone who works at <laughs> airbnb and they're like it's as fantastic being in the business as it has been received externally as well. And that's because they've done the groundwork. They've figured out the pain points. They've figured out what, you know, what is going to have the greatest impact on someone right now leaving a business when there's not really a huge amount of jobs to go for. And how can mm -hmm. we make that journey easier for them and support them in that? Yeah. Um, and that, that doesn't need to be like really expensive. Like, you know, Airbnb have obviously got a decent amount of money to chuck behind pay packet, you know, 
exit pay packets and you know give people all these tools and things but it doesn't need to have a huge cost association i think that's where people kind of get confused as they think all these things cost loads of money but actually the money that you will lose as a business off a bad experience had bad candidate experience bad client experience bad employee experience phenomenally larger than it will be if you invest a bit of time and money in creating that yeah that's kind of this this true cost of hiring isn't it there's loads of stats that go around around what uh you know all the figures that go into someone hiring um but you know if people are leaving and they're retaining it those costs just keep going on and on and on um exactly. uh, a lot of um a lot of the people kind of watching and they've signed up there they work within probably recruitment agencies a lot of the time um and in normal times whatever that means at the moment uh headcount's always been a, a big target for for recruitment agencies so if if a marketer who is is not really involved in that internal recruitment piece and creating that employer brand at the moment what do they what do they need to be doing to make sure they're they're part of that conversation and they're not they're not coming in at the end when someone else has decided oh we need to do this can you just you know create something or to use a popular phrase in the whatsapp group to to jazz it up um you know <laughs> how how, do, how does a marketer ensure that they're part of the conversation at the very beginning I mean, I think that has to start with relationships. Like mm -hmm. you, the I am a firm believer in the quality of your relationships is the quality of your business, quality of your career, the quality of your life. So if you don't have a strong relationship with the IR function, with the leaders within that business, with the managers in the business, like that's a much bigger problem than whether or not you have a seat at the table in recruitment marketing, mm -hmm. because you need to be able to have the rapport with people to go, actually, like you're spending five grand on this LinkedIn you know talent acquisition whatever like i know for fact that's not going to do well because of xyz like mm -hmm. you're saving the business money you're 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 creating a need for your seat to be there yeah. um i certainly found that when i was i, I like created my when i was at finlay james i created that seat for myself yeah. um, that, that was going to be my a, point if it doesn't already exist is yeah and, and you and you understand it, it your way in to, there. yeah exactly yeah so all, so no one's going to ask you no one's yeah. going to ask you because particularly in recruitment agencies, we all know this, the marketing function is siloed off and asked to do presentations, create business cards, you know, all that stuff that recruitment, not all, but recruit a lot of recruitment agency owners and managers and consultants believe marketing to be right. They're a function there to provide a service, which is basically collateral to ship out to their clients and, and candidates. You need to put yourself in a position whereby you have a seat at the table and you can't ask permission for that you just have to make it happen mm. um and if you don't have the confidence to do that like drop me a dm and we'll make we'll make a plan for you to get the confidence to do that because if you're not proactive about you know getting your elbows out and shoving your way to the front you will never have an impact on a business's ability to grow scale all the rest of it which is is so which is what marketing is like you're there to to facilitate the business growth on a headcount side, on a commercial side, and on a kind of evolutional side mm. of how that business has gone from X culture to Y culture. Like you are an important part of that journey. Yeah. Um, and if people aren't educated to realize that, you've got to educate them. And that's yeah. your job. It's not what no one else. no one owes you anything. You have to get your way to use Victoria Rush's term, get yourself get yourself a seat at the table. <laughs> no, exactly. And I, I think I think you can if, if you're on the agency side um, and apologies to, to any in-house people who are watching or, or listening, but usually in-house is a little bit further ahead than uh, the agency side on employer branding, which is which is a little bit ironic, considering that a lot of agencies now are trying to uh, to use a, an overphrased word or, or pivot their clients and offer them employer branded services uh, when they haven't even done it right themselves which is you know that's completely insane but you can you can learn a lot from the you know from the in-house market who who do have um in a lot of cases you know employer brand managers and they do have dedicated um you know like experience and you know employee experience people and things so learn learn from there um like in a couple of things agency world sometimes a little bit uh a little bit behind in in that sense but um what 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 kind of things have you seen seen work from an employer branded point of view you mentioned you mentioned uber like in the current environment but what, what's the kind of stuff that that you see that that works from a, 
employer branding point of view i know you know it covers a lot of stuff but yeah it, sure some stuff out i mean from certainly from like an externally communicated piece um you know getting your that whole advocacy thing is really important because if mm -hmm. you could like happy employees are vocal employees so if you can get them involved in somehow delivering that message um that is really powerful and i know i mean people have got their own opinions on linkedin and i know i said this on the podcast that i thought linkedin had a really strong employer brand and i still believe that they have a really strong employer brand because they've got a whole team dedicated to finding people within the business that have a great story to tell and then using mm -hmm. their story to and leveraging it for linkedin's branding purposes yeah. there i think i don't know well, it, it may well be because they sit in that talent space don't they that they kind of intertwine their employer brand and their their branding as a corporate brand very well mm. um so i think that they do that whole video piece and that whole storytelling piece really well um from an internal perspective i mean i i'm working with 11 investments in an em employee engagement capacity and like as i said a minute ago happy employees are vocal employees so I think a lot of us tend to focus on how can we communicate the message instead of how can we create the message? Like if you focus on getting your employees on side and get, giving them a seat at the table and, and giving them a stake in how the business is, is run and communicating and, and, and that whole EVP piece. I know to be clear, obviously EVP and employer brand are similar, but they're two different things. Like one's the ma macro, one's the micro, but if you give them a, a kind of a, a chunk of that EVP process, you are giving them a stake in the business that will implore them to want to communicate mm. with the outside world that how amazing this company is. And I really love them. And like, we've got champions within within 11 investments who are really vocal about how much they love working at the within the, the business they work in. And like that, I can't, the, the reach that they have, I would be spending like 20 grand on to get that kind of organic reach, probably yeah. more because their their social networks in instance linkedin have got 10 times the reach of what i could get as a logo on linkedin so that is the easiest way to get people engaged and also then amplify your brand is get is you know leverage the people you've got if you're a yeah. 50 person business that's that's 500 times the reach of yeah. you as a business it's kind of it, it, i think it's the marketer's role to if you like it, it in my mind or what i'd be doing if i was internal is you you kind of create the the framework and and the toolkit uh, around it and then empower and teach your staff how to how to use it use it yeah. best but equally this has to this has to come down from the the very top you know it's, people can't be afraid to to have an opinion oh. on, on topics they you know they can't they can't think that, oh no, look, this is in core hours. I can't go and post something like, like this on, on LinkedIn because I should be on the sales call. It's a it's a much wider piece in in that sense as well, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, we were talking about it the other day with um, members only on, on a webinar we were, I was doing with a couple of the other guys around building authority, and that was more geared towards personal brand. But your employees' brand have a have a very big role to play in this in this whole thing i mean like yes that that's theirs and that's something they'll take with them for the entirety of, of their career but you know I, like i have been associated with finlay james for a long a long time and i haven't worked with them for over a year so people go yeah. oh, you're, you're used to work for finlay james and so my my name is associated with that business and that's good because it's advocating that business that if someone knows who i am that's they already know who that business is so yeah it's, it's important and and to, to go back to your kind of point about like the, the admin time and it's not in core hours and all the rest of it like that's such a load of bollocks like yeah. if, if you're if you're if you think of it in this way your hit rate of making like 100 calls a day which i know a lot of people will say is not the norm but it is i speak to agencies a lot of agencies encourage their bd people to do 100 calls a day your hit rate of those hundreds calls a day will be about three or four rolls a week in normal times right so that success rate is shocking so if you can take that back and go, right, if I'm sharing a piece of content that's seen by 10,000 people that I get 200 reactions on and 89 comments, that reach is phenomenally better than you just leaving voicemails for eight hours a day. So yeah. instead of it looking as an additional task, think of it as part of your BD strategy because mm. or, or for your candidate pooling strategy, like creating and sharing content and having an opinion that, that resonates with your target audience is BD at scale. 
yeah. I do absolutely no BD. I don't do a single call. My job is as a consultant with recruitment agencies. I don't make a single outbound call and I'm fully booked for the next six weeks. Yeah. And I have literally no time in the day to even make a cup of coffee. So like proof of concept and like, I'm not cheap. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so they're, they're like, if you're, if you're, if you're just to clarify, <laughs> just to clarify, like sort of that's my point. Like, I think people think that sort of inbound lead, warm leads are in some bat, in some way, not as good as cold. Mm. Like, where I don't know where that's come from, but that seems to be the case in in recruitment agencies. Is they believe cold leads are in some way not as good as warm ones. Like, I, I warm ones will buy from you. All you need to do is just communicate in a yeah. language they understand, and then it's done. It's the same with talent. I'd much rather go for a warm talent lead than a cold one. It's a lot yeah. more expensive to go for a cold one and it's a lot longer to go for a cold one. And they're less likely to stay with you for more than two years, which we know <laughs> in an agency, you need to be there two years to be profitable. Yeah, I think um, I, I just want to pick up on like Fiona's point as well. From a marketing point of view, we should all be so much focused on 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 experience yeah? yeah so um on the candidate side we we focus on it or we should focus on it a lot with um with website journeys how they interact with us at certain touch points across social media across email etc cetera, etc cetera. Same, same with the, the the client side you know think about the wider experience how we invoice people even i think marketers should be talking about that and then when it comes to employer branding um that employee experience piece is is so it's so huge um but marketing needs to get involved in every step of it and that, that isn't just you know we, we bang on about it. that isn't just the office environment it's not the incentives and the socials and everything like that it starts at the it starts at the very very beginning well, well go from attraction it starts from the job descriptions you know the job descriptions of people you're trying to hire are they are they accurate you know do do they sell the business well does it show the a potential employee what they can go on are the career paths realistic um or are they just out of the box stuff that you you know you do all the time is the interview process when when a marketer is very unlikely to be involved in an interview process but you should still care about it because mm -hmm. you want to know that it's leaving a positive impression on the people who are coming in for an interview whether whether they move on to the next stage or they're rejected you know uh, from a from a marketing point of view i'd be obsessed with that at every stage if they come on board what's the onboarding process like what's the learning and development like what's the offboarding process like as a as a marketer i'd be I'd be asking my FD. I'd be asking the head of, you know, head of L and D. Um, I'd be obviously the CEOs, MDs, and that saying, I want to either shadow each of these processes, or I want to be involved at some point to be able to assess it because I want to help improve the overall um, employee experience. I think that's so powerful if you could, you know, jump out of your your little silo potentially and get involved in every single facet. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And certainly from an agency perspective, I believe you have three customers, mm -hmm. your client, your candidate and your potential hire. And then from an internal perspective, you have obviously your two customers, your customer and your, your employees. And I've always said that you need to treat your employees like your customers, because if you're not treating your employees like your customers, they won't look after your customer. Mm -hmm. So it, as I said earlier, it kind of works in a triangle, doesn't it? It's like your employer brand, your employees brand, and then your corporate brand, and they all have to link up for there to be this kind of powerful, you know, impactful um, and commercially successful business. I mean, yeah. the, the, the employee engagement piece is one of the most fundamentally overlooked elements of, um, you know, any kind of marketing function ever, because, I know certainly being in a recruitment agency, you were working on so many different things. It's really difficult to go, actually, I want to get involved in that. Or can I get involved in that? Is my place to get involved in that? Because you're working on loads of other reactive things that get chucked on you every day. Mm. But if you're, if you're get kind of clear on what you want your outcomes to be and the impact you want to have on the business, you'll find yourself looking at stuff and going, actually, I don't need to be creating presentation because I can template that and the consultants do it themselves. Yeah. Or I don't need to be helping these consultants with 
um, individual LinkedIn posts. I can run a workshop and tell them what good looks like and then they can go and do it themselves. It's about you don't have to be busy all the time. Like I know that sounds really like, OK, if I say it and in practice, it's really hard. I get it. I've, I've worked in that agency where you're getting pulled a thousand different places. And that's ultimately marketing at the end of the day. But you need to get really clever and really proactive on where you're allocating your time. Because mm. if you want to be impactful, you can't be doing individual presentations. You can't be doing individual proofreading of people's posts. Yeah. You have to be involved in the in the, the macro stuff. Yeah. Like tactical stuff, 90% of what we do as marketers could be done by a consultant. And it's yeah, just about sure. educating them and giving them the tools to do it. And that would make them feel good too, because they'd be like, look at this amazing presentation I just made. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? With, so a, squash, you, with a squash logo. With a squash logo, yeah, a see-through, <laughs> a see-through logo. <laughs> yeah. I think Fiona, mate, it's a it's a brilliant point. There it is it is all about behaviours, especially in the agency world, um, and it's not just about the behaviours, but I think it's um, it's rewarding behaviours as well. I think in the agency world, people get rewarded for billings, regardless yeah, sure. of what you might say in, in terms of promotion criteria etc cetera, etc cetera. you might have that little line let's be honest if people hit quarter of a million half a million a million they're going to be a uh, director associate director senior consultant whatever it might be regardless of behaviors in, in a, a you know i am i'm stereotyping there but i'm almost certain in the majority of companies that will be the case and i think that flip to um rewarding behaviors and encouraging behaviors it really needs to happen and we will have a it will have a huge benefit on um on on employer brands and understanding what it is now I, do you know what there, there's a part of me that says if you're uh, i don't like this phrase if you are an an old school recruiter and it is a little bit um boiler room etc cetera, etc cetera, that is a massive jug of water um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, if, if if you are a little bit boiler room, a little bit old school, and things like that, and you're not going to change, own it. You know, because yeah. <laughs> do you know what? There are plenty of people uh, I've worked with sure who, 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 who like it. <laughs> there's a market for that. Yeah, the, and, and whether we agree with that or not, that that's fine. But they'll those companies will get judged on it um, by by us, by other people. But in some ways, you, you have to own it because go back to, to what we said initially is your employer brand exists. It exists whether you like it or not. And it's not what you say it is it just like a normal brand. It's what it's what other people say, say it is. So you, you're not going to hide from it. Oh, you're not going to hide from it um, very long at all. And to be honest, that, that brings me... Um, that brings me nicely onto the point now uh, around the impact that um, that COVID is going to have on employer brand, employer brand strategies. Um, I'm I'm expecting a tsunami in a couple of months' time of glass door reviews of statuses mm -hmm. on LinkedIn from people who have been treated um, like dog shit. If I'm being honest, yeah. but equally, uh, equally, people have been treated well. You mentioned Uber, and that, that's happening. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a game changer, isn't it? I think massively. And I think, yeah. like the just to pick up on, I think what the fundamental point of, of of this is: your brand, whether it's employer brand, corporate brand, whatever, is not what you tell people it is. It's what other people tell other people it yeah. is. Um, and so this whole employer, this whole idea of employer brand has always been, what can we do for you? This is what we can provide for you. This is the environment that we have. Like, look how good our people are after joining us. And that's kind of formed the baseline of every kind of initiative we run mm. as an employer branding function, right? Whatever yeah. your capacity within the business. Now we're moving in, we've moved into COVID, you know, there are some businesses that are doing great jobs. There are some businesses that are doing okay, which is probably the most of us. We're just trying to navigate this situation and do the best we can. Um, and there are other businesses that are just quite frankly being morons. Like they have no emp empathy for the people on furlough. I mean, I had, I don't know if anyone, some, some people on here might might follow me on um, LinkedIn or not, but I, I actually, I didn't use names for obvious reasons, but I outed a director on LinkedIn saying how poorly they treated their their furloughed team member they they had 
this team member had shared a, a post I'd written about furloughed employees having mental health imp implications of being on furlough and how employees should, you know, reach out, just have a bit of empathy, like drop in every couple of days and just say, how are you doing? Like, oh, by the way, here's a really great podcast, might keep you busy, that type of stuff, just general human stuff, right? The, the lonely and marks are, yeah. <laughs> exactly um and just that that kind of interaction that you would expect from people that you spend 70 to 80 percent of your week with in the normal business world and um the director of the business that, that employed that person that person was on furlough by the way for obvious they shared a furlough post wrote on their post saying basically that that person that was on furlough needed to prove to her that he had, was deserving of his job back and that it was up to him to reach out to her to facilitate any kind of engagement. Wow. And so, you know, you know, Mark, what I'm like, Glenn, I was like, no, fuck that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I am not going to have that. So, mm. uh, yeah, I, I just and, and unfortunately, that mentality is rife with a lot of a lot of businesses. And I get it. Like I speak to business owners every single day who are struggling. Like not only are they worried about their family their mortgage their whatever they're worrying about all their team as well like mm. the, the safety of their jobs and the safety of their mortgages and the safety of getting food on their tables like it's a big responsibility but just just be human like we're all in the same shit storm here like yeah. albeit different boats but we're all in the same shit storm so let's just be a bit empathetic you know and it goes back to that engagement piece how many people do you think are going to leave their employer when this is over yeah a good chunk the movement in the employment market once it's settled down is going to be ridiculous particularly in industries like recruitment people yeah. are going to go no nah, i'm leaving this is terrible regardless of how well they thought the business before this point yeah and so, equally there'll, there'll be there'll be there'll be plenty of recruitment companies you know they'll they'll start hiring again and, and they'll be pushing it but I guarantee the question, you know, that, that classic we'll question, yeah. yeah, the classic question at the end of an interview, you got any questions for us will be, well, what did you do during the, the three months of, of lockdown and COVID? How did your company react? How did, how did you react as an individual? And you have to be prepared to, you know, to, to answer that. And honestly, <laughs> and yeah, uh, you know, you've got, you have to go some way to build in up trust again, if you haven't acted right in the, in the current moment as well haven't you absolutely and that that's what it's gone from it's gone from this is what we can do to you to this is what we've done for our team during mm. this time like that's the that is the pivot to use the term of the moment is that's the pivot um people will really care because ultimately though a lot of those people will be leaving other organizations that didn't treat them properly so they're going to make sure they're going to want to make sure that the company they are joining is going to treat them well um, yeah. and it's not too late like if you feel like you're in a business right now that's not doing enough mm -hmm. um it's not too late like you can you can change this you can change the narrative of what your employer brand and your engagement piece will be um yeah going into this I, I will admit we weren't probably as proactive as we thought as i think we should have been but that's mainly because we didn't realize the impact and the length of time in which we would be in lockdown mm -hmm. um so as soon as we had a bit of a a, a kind of you know, we, we had to go and work from home from the 16th and then on the 23rd or whatever it was, we were in lockdown. So by the 23rd, we were like, OK, we need a serious plan here because, you know, if we if we are going to be working from home long term, we back then were thinking we'd be back in the office around June. Right. So this is March. We're thinking June. We're now June and this is still a long way off. Like, So we had to really be reactive and proactive and make a plan of what we were going to do with our team. So, you know, we had teams on furlough. We've done a weekly call every single week, but we call the games room. So it's a virtual games room. We have a games room at work. So it seemed, and that's a very core part of our culture is people just get up and go and play games together. Mm -hmm. um, there's that, that's kind of collaborative people piece. And we encourage that. We don't want people to be chained to their desk and not actually use the games that are available. We want them to go and use them. Um, so we've done a games room every week, which has been really fun. Um, we, we last yesterday we had, it's on a Wednesday yesterday. We did a, uh, guess the baby picture which was hilarious no one got yeah. them right and then uh the other thing we did was a cahoots um quiz which is also really good um we've done pictionary in, in breakout rooms on zoom we've done um heads up equally hilarious cards against humanity like silly things that you think aren't that fun but actually when you get 40 odd people together on a zoom is absolutely hilarious and giving people something to look forward to each week yeah. outside of a work capacity whether you're working or not is really important and also you've got to consider like furloughed people are 
not working with you every day. They're not speaking to you every day. They're probably stuck at home with their housemates, their family or their parents. And they need that interaction. They need that that kind of drive and, and engagement and, you know, doing these things does not take a lot of time and effort and thought. Like just get on a Zoom call, get everyone on, play Pictionary, do a quiz, yeah. have a drink. If, if, if anything, pub. yeah, what's, yeah what, what, tonight, seven o'clock onwards. Um, what, um, and, and a lot of that stuff might stick when we go back to a normal. And to be honest, there's unlikely to be a normal. A, a lot of companies go now embrace the, I can imagine the, the flexible working. So you, you, we're still going to need to think about that engagement a lot more. You mentioned some great things there. I've got a client who's doing kind of a weekly radio show, if you like, from from, from his bedroom every week. Um, gets a special guest on who can submit like five of their songs. They do like Q and A's and do a quiz and stuff. And you know, look, it's it's fun, you know, and it and it and it's stuff that you probably could have done in normal times. It probably would have had value. And I think, hopefully, fingers crossed, is you know, if we're going to take some positives out of out of this um, this period with regards to employer brand and just general, is that hopefully we've accelerated a few things um, in terms oh, yeah. of in terms of trust, in terms of employee engagement, um, and then building out that on the wider employer brand thing. So only fingers crossed that we've um, that we've uh, moved it forward. Um, now. I, I thought about discussing this um, and I, you know, I went back and forth, but I think it is important because I've, I've made a commitment myself to to highlight it a bit more. I know that that you're very passionate about it. Um, and I think, again, it does tie into the employer brand inside of things. Um, the recent movement with with Black Lives Matter, um, a lot of companies are being um, are being judged at the moment. Um, a lot of employees are demanding certain things of their employees around the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I know it's important to you um, for for personal reasons as well as the you know the wider human element to it. Uh, but can we tell companies what they should be doing now, or you know what's what's your take on it from the conversations you've had and the things you've seen at the moment? Yeah, I mean we're still working through this ourselves and i'm working with a couple of other companies that are kind of wanting to address this but don't know how and i know we've had discussions in the in the whatsapp group about how to navigate this because it like as megan markle said the only wrong thing to do is to do nothing so fundamentally something has to be done but at the same time you don't want to be one of those companies that's just jumping on like the gay pride bandwagon the, the mm. nhs bandwagon the black lives matter bandwagon. you've changed your as, logo and you've done it yeah yeah so it, that's as bad as saying nothing in my point because that means you've not fundamentally understood the core issue you've just slapped you know a band-aid on and and kept going exactly how you were going before mm -hmm. um Obviously, it's important to me because my husband's black, my kids are black. Um, I, uh, on the human element, as you said, like I, I just, you know, as most people will, will feel, ha are absolutely horrified by the thought that my child would be in some way held back or they couldn't get a job because of the colour of their skin or like that's horrifying. So, yes, human element, it's important. But you, you said I, yourself, you've educated, you know, despite you know, having a, a black husband and black kids, even yourself over and living in that life to, you know, or alongside that life, can you say, um, you've educated yourself and found out a hell of a lot more, haven't you, over the past week, two weeks than, than you even realised? Yeah, absolutely. And like, certainly my husband and I, we have very challenging conversations with one another because I'm white middle class. I went to private school. Like I am the epitome of white privilege, right? Like I... I've had doors open for me at every stage of my career, whether that's getting a foot in the door at MS for my first internship or whatever. Like I've always had a foot in the door somewhere and that's white privilege, right? At, at its very core. So we've always had challenging conversations because we grew up very differently, despite the the difference in our, the color of our skin, we grew up very differently. Um, and I guess the kind of that sort of, like I, when you think of racism, I think when you grow up like the way I did is, you know, people actually outwardly aggressively being racist. That's kind of what we're told racism is, right? Which we all can agree is disgusting. Yeah, the, the no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Correct. Like that's clubs, what we yeah. think of. That's yeah. what we think of when we think racism. I think it when it became truly apparent to me that that 
was just the tip of the iceberg. Like if you think of racism as an iceberg, we see this much. Mm. The majority of it is under the surface that we wouldn't see because we're not black or we're not Asian or we're not whatever. Um, so it, I think the first instance for me was when I was in Louis Vuitton with my husband and he was wanting to buy something and he was refused ser- to be served basically because the, the the service person decided that he couldn't afford whatever it is he wanted to buy. And, and then so since then, which was like 2013, there has been instances along the way where I've gone, whoa, like this is really bad the way that this, this is going. And I, that's not even towards me. Mm. So like I can't even imagine how it feels to be living in that. Like that's just I, I, like I have no words. Like I don't think there are any words to describe that. So, yes, in this time has been very, very um eye-opening i certainly believe that it, it's forced us to have more challenging conversations that we ha- have had before and and get really deep into like the psychology of racism and um uh, how people are judged and um you know that you know little things like my husband's spoken about walking down the street when it's raining and it's cold and he'll have his hood up and if he sees a group of kind of young white people coming towards him he'll take his hood down and smile oh i think Amelia's frozen. Is Amelia frozen for everyone in the in the chat? Okay, so I, I'm not going to speak for Amelia on this on this subject. I think we'll um, we'll give her a, a couple of minutes. It is, yeah, John. It is a it's a paused face that I'll I'll definitely be um I'll, I'll definitely be sending to her. Um, and I will take that picture now. Um, I'll give her. Um, I'll give her a couple of minutes to uh, to see if she to see if she reconnects. But um, just pick it up on on the the Black Lives Matter stuff because I, I I've been speaking to a lot of my clients um, about it recently, and uh, it's it's a difficult one. I don't know where I stand. Um, for I think for a lot of businesses. Um, they need to take some time to to educate themselves. Um, I don't think it's time for bandwagon jumping. Um, I think it's a time for, like you say, for for educating and and making a plan as to as to what you want to do to um, you know to to posit- to positively impact it. Um, so Amelia has dropped out. Uh, welcome to the, the all of my bedroom now. Let me just see if she is back on and I can invite her back um, let's see whether she connects here you go she's accepted and connecting so hopefully she'll be back soon and we can pick up um, where we where we left off <laughs> there she is welcome Hi. back Amelia I think that was my that was my uh, internet I think <laughs> Sorry okay. about that. <laughs> I, I'm not sure where you left off, but I've got a brilliant screenshot of the of the face that was that was frozen there. That I was it, I'll, was I'll it impassioned? Um, it was mouth, oh, brilliant. mouth I'm wide open, to it. mouth wide open, everything. So yeah, a bit <laughs> like that. So um, uh, I'm not sure where where you cut off. So just just carry on from wherever you want to pick up from. I think I think really what I'm without getting too deep into my personal feelings about this because I think those will be very clear if anyone's. Po- seen the stuff that I've been posting and, and commenting on other people's stuff on LinkedIn like they'll be very clear on what my opinions are on this but I think fundamentally as an empl- as employers we have a absolute duty to educate ourselves on black history racism um, how potentially our bias has impacted the hires we've made the decisions we've made as a business and admitting that you weren't educated previously it's not an admittance of guilt like we're all in this same boat but it's about starting and making that proactive decision and communicating that to your teams to say okay we didn't realize it was as bad as it is or perhaps we didn't realize it existed at all we have taken the time to look into this to educate ourselves and we would like to educate you also as to what we've done and what we 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 maybe recommend based on our own research that you might like to do Mm. um and then figure out the next steps of your plan like it, it you just ha- it's like with everything you just have to start and that might be as simple as going and looking at you know 13th or the Khalif Browder story or when they see us or Selma or all these other films that you literally can just plonk your bum in front of the tv and switch on on Netflix and that will give you the biggest education into what it's life or like 
as a non-white person in the Western world mm. um, than you will ever get from from just living your life and asking questions. Like it is important that you come to the table prepared, right? You, yeah. There's no. We've seen so many posts from people who've you know made all these um linkedin posts and instagram posts about standing with black lives matter and then you look at their employee base and they're all white like okay great but what are you really doing are you educating yeah, everyone it. in the it's business that, it's that owning own it. it again isn't it yeah i think i think say hey we fucked be... up we yeah. don't know so yeah. we're learning how to right um, i think we need that we, ultimately you know and I, i've certainly been guilty from it i think a lot of people if not everyone needs to go from that um that approach of, well, I'm not racist. Yeah. And, and do you know what? The the major a, a fair amount of people, the majority I'd say, probably aren't racist. But the people who aren't racist need to actively become anti-racist. Correct. You know, it needs to be called out a lot, a lot more, whether it's with individuals, uh, with your friends and family, and have those difficult conversations, or or within your business um, and, and stuff like that. So they're difficult conversations to have, um, but they do definitely need to be had. Um, just to just to kind of close things up, going back to the employer branding stuff. What can um, what can people be doing right now? Marketers doing right now in their efforts to help in employer branding. Um, what can they go away and do, or what should they do now? what they're straight away actions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think in the first instance coming up with like actionable takeaways, if you haven't already got a seat at the kind of leadership table, you need to go and make yourself one. Like yeah. the first thing you need to do is call your manager, call your CEO, your director and say, right, I want to make a change in this business. I cannot do that being siloed off. So yeah. first instance, get your seat. Second thing you need to do um, is look at what you're currently doing internally let's forget about the brand for a second take the brand off the table what are you doing internally to impact your current team and how can you as a marketer have a better more positive impact on what they what is currently being done it may be that you need to you know pull together a sanity saver like i did with our team we've, we've got a pretty hefty excel document which was the first thing touch point if you want to use recruiter mm. language we sent to our our teams that are working from home to keep them busy um you know whether you're you're working one-on-one -on -one with your furloughed team to help them like get them involved in courses help them help them kind of figure out what they need to be doing on a on a day-to-day -day basis and building that rapport on an individual level as well um, because ultimately that whole internal piece needs to be fixed. It's like that I was saying earlier about the therapy, like you need to do the therapy before you can go out and, and live your best life. <laughs> like yeah. you, you have, you have to, you have to do the hard work and, and the hard work involves you getting on an emotional level with everyone within the business. And that, when I say with everyone, if you're in a thousand person business, obviously individually, you are not going to be able to get to know people intimately, but you can get to know the employees intimately at mass. Like you can yep. get to know what their drivers are and their motivation. So yeah, get a seat at the table and then influence that table. And then also internally as well, because yeah. they will create advocate advocates and that's what will drive an authentic employer brand chip chip away chip away keep going marketers needle um, movers <laughs> yeah exactly um amelia th thanks thanks so much for for joining um thank you the, the hiccup the hiccup didn't derail it um there so uh it's really good uh thank you everyone fiona kath jim everyone else in the in the chat who's who's commented and, and inputted it's uh, really appreciated uh next week i've got um kim pasto from lawrence harvey international talking about rebranding and billy humphreys uh from mrl talking about bringing video into your recruitment strategy so um they should all be available on my profile here on on crowdcast if not head over to uh, the lonely and uh, they're all there and the past ones as well so we're done and dusted for another week thank you everyone thanks amelia thank you cheers bye